You can see the global situation, the global map, and you can see the green parts here. These are the internally displaced people. All the others are asylum seekers and uh, refugees. And you can see that most of the migrants and the refugees they come from very poor countries. They mostly migrate to less poor countries, but only a little proportion of them really migrate to high-income countries. The situation in Germany, um, with regard to asylum. Applications. You can see we already had quite a huge number of asylum applications in the 90s, with a peak in 1992. That was mostly due to the former Yugoslavian War. And now we again have a peak here in 2015. But some of these, these are follow up applications where the initial application was rejected and then reapplied for asylum. And this is the total number of migrants in Germany in the last um, 20 years. Years. And you can see there was a peak of 1.5 million in 1992, and we had another peak here in 2015, 2.1 million. And these migrants now com comprise also um, um, worker migrants from other European countries, asylum seekers, refugees, so all the migrants from all over the world which arrive in Germany. You can see the figure of the German repatriates. So German repatriates is a group who originally comes from, originally left Germany in the 17th century, moved to Russia, and then after the course of the Soviet Union, around 1990, came back to Germany. We had also German repatriates, ethnic Germans coming from Poland after the war, and from other Eastern European countries, but a huge proportion of German repatriates came after and this red area here is, um, counts to 1.6 million refugees. That was our study chart subject in the group of migrant technology inside the data where my PhD is. I first want to generally talk about migration. We can distinguish between so called push factors and pull factors. The push factors they are usually ethnic conflicts, war, destruction of the environment. These are external factors pushing migration. It could also be cultural discrimination, discrimination uh, repressions, and persecution, and the exclusion of completely ethnic groups from society. As I said, these are external factors, and they are life threatening usually, and they um, lead to the total immigration of subgroups. These are so called ethnic migrants. Um, they are usually criminalized, criminalized in their immigration, the kind of origin, and they are usually called. As refugees in the most countries, 
And then we have the so called pool factors. Um, these are migrants who immigrate into prospect of better education in the target country or into unemployment in their um, original country. There is oftentimes a demand for skilled workers in the target country, which attracts migrants to move from um, less developed countries to these target countries. They also want to improve their quality of life. And these are all intrinsic driving, intrinsic um, motivations, intrinsic drive to immigrate. There's no emergency for them um, to immigrate, no life threatening conditions. They just want to improve their social position. And this is oftentimes a selective migration because mainly young and healthy migrants immigrate um, for school factors. And this can be the cause of the so called healthy migrant methods. Oftentimes, if we investigate, Health status of migrant groups, we surprisingly find that they are healthier than the um, population of migrant families. One of the reasons is that mainly young and healthy migrants tend to immigrate, to immigrate across countries, and the um, sick, migrant, sick population is left behind. There's another cause for this healthy migrant effect. So you can imagine they come from different settings. So if they come from low income countries, there can be, for instance, a high burden of infectious disease in the country of origin and a high CVD rate in the target country. And if they immigrate now from this high burden of infectious disease to a target country, the infections can be immediately cured. And there's no threat to um, new infections anymore. And the CVD, usually, if you are um, exposed to CVD receptors in the target country, the onset of CVDs take some time. So there's sometimes a lag time of 20 to 30 years until CVD onset, and this is an overall healthier population of migrants. So we have a short-term positive effect of hygiene movement in target countries, um, a large lag time between CVD exposure to risk factors of CVD and the CVD onset. And then you can really see that the migrants initially have a lower overall Now the German repatriates from Russia some um, sort of some some points to history of German repatriates. Um, that's not known to many people living in Germany. Nobody had German suburbs in Moscow in the 16th century. 1653 was the first German suburb in Moscow. There was even a German newspaper in 1727, which is in St. Petersburg. And then there was this invitation manifest from Sarah Lavino. So she was receiving for workers to come to Russia, mainly for farmers. They need farms there. And there was a really bad situation with the group. So many Europeans followed this invitation and moved to Russia, possibly for the Germans. Germans had about 27,000 Germans who immigrated, and about 33,500 rates of that time. Immigration was really not a nice thing, it was really a big challenge. But uh, between 1764 and 1773, all the hundred German settlements were registered in the Volga region, then in St. Petersburg and in South Ukraine. And there was a second invitation manifest that many others followed, mainly people from Baden-Württemberg, from Altenheim, and Alsace, and they settled in the Black Sea region. Then they got a lot of privileges from the Russian government, so they got land allotments, they got the freedom, um, religious freedom. They got loans and they were able to be allowed to sell down their communities. Here you can see the map where they, where they immigrated to. So, here are the origin countries and states of Germany. And they mainly immigrated to the Black Sea region in South Ukraine and to the northern region. Around 1897, already 1.8 million Germans were living in the Russian Empire. But then from 1900 onwards, there was a creeping deterioration of their conditions. So they were slowly seen as inner enemies. And then when they reached the second and first world war started, they were really seen as inner enemies. So the Russian government tried to cut their uh, privileges. They also forced them to learn Russian, to stop speaking German, and so forth. But still, the community still increased until 2.5 million Germans living in Russia in 2014. And there was a big anti German pogrom in Moscow and religious persecutions. And then the beginning of the expropriations of Germans 
Nein, selber in Osten hoch Warschau. Also der Lost Ort, der Länder, Lost Ort, der Lost ist dann sofort. In den 8. Oktober wurde schon die Ebene Lost, der Right to uh, Empowering Nations. But still, the Volga region, it was a very prosperous region, where it was the primary for the Russian Empire. So the Volga region, the Germans were really needed, the majority of the population there, and they kept their autonomous status. Um, they even later got the German capital. Um, 1924. But then there were a lot of famines in the following year, and the local region they had to give all their um, crops and grains to other parts of Russia, but themselves they suffered a lot from the famines and couldn't really feed their own people. So the number of Germans decreased from 2.5 million in 1914 um, to 1.2 million in 1926. Um, but still, the Volga region still could keep the German um, status, so they even got a German university and um, were an autonomous republic in 1913. Then, um, close, when, um, close to the um, Second World War, there were this terror years in Russia, where 55,000 Germans were among the 680,000 people murdered, and around 40.7% of the Indians. Were arrested were ethnically German. So these are much more than proportion of Germans lost compared to other ethnic groups. So that means that the Germans were really uh, especially specifically under pressure in Russia. And after Hitler infringed on the secret market of with Russia, massive persecutions began. So dissolving of the autonomous world of Republic that means they suddenly lost all their status, they lost all the privileges. And the majority of the German we had Germans in Russia, ethnic Germans. That we call it from the Volga region to Kazakhstan, with about 450,000. Um, in the Second World War, then all the possessions of the Germans were confiscated. They got the status of lawlessness, and all together, also including the um, southern part of Ukraine and the Black Sea region, around 1.2 million Germans were relocated to the eastern parts of Russia, Siberia, Kazakhstan, all this. Huge, um, low density populated areas. Around 250,000 were subjected to forced labor, and 30% of them died. And then, after the calculation of the German right, um, life on banishment, um, the, the set of life on banishment, if they tried to escape from these deportations, they were put in labor camps. And the number saved around 700,000 refugees in the displacement. And there was only a gradual relaxation after World War II, so after Stalin died in 1943, there was only a creeping improvement of the conditions for the displaced Germans. They tried to get back their autonomous status, they tried to move back to their regions, the Volga region, the Black Sea regions, and to Ukraine. But in 1964, there was a governmental rejection of, rejection of official records to re establish these autonomous areas. And in around 1970, there were about 1.8 million Germans living in Russia. Um, if you compare the numbers here now, 1925, still around 95% of Germans specified Germany as their mother tongue. In 1970, you can see now the consequences of this classification. Only 60% spoke Russian, 1989, so 49%. So the German mother tongue really then we had again ethnical conflicts in Russia, the Germans were specifically under pressure. And then the Russian government reacted with a new law about immigration from Russia, and it was actually the start of the immigration of Germans from Russia. So the beginning with slow numbers, but it massively increased around 1990. You'll see another map. Now, this here, this part here is the settlement areas where they settled before they were deported to the relocated to this eastern part, so you can see. How far to Eastern Russia they were relocated in the Second World War, Kazakhstan, Siberia, and so forth. So, really far from the original settlements in the Volga region. Um, this is also interesting. So, you can see here 1939, only 20% of the Germans lived in the Asian part of Russia, and 1989, around 90% of the Germans came from this region. 1989, there were 2 million, about 2 million Germans living in Russia, and then 1990, this massive exodus from Russia 
um, started and the government from Russia reacted with a lot of concessions to the Germans. So they, they allowed again them to speak German, to keep their German cultures and so forth, but they didn't get to keep them and they didn't help them with the land. Um, 1992, after the Polish group saw from the Soviet there was a final rejection of these autonomous areas, so they were not allowed to settle there, and then they tried all to get to Germany. And then we had a peak of emigration wave to Germany around 1993, 1994. There were around 200,000 ethnic Germans coming every year. In addition to that, they had the refugees from the Soviet Union. The German government was supporting that a lot, so initially they gave a lot of support. They like finance language courses. Um, they even paid some care tickets for some of the Germans. They really like helped complete families to move to Germany. And then gradually they restricted all of that, mostly due to pressure from right wing parties. That was like some of you might remember from the Republican Party at the time. They were prominent in Germany in the 1990s in reaction to this immigration, mass immigration. And the government reacted to that and restricted all this. Um, government support. So, language courses initially were about um, up to 12 to 15 months, and they were restricted for a few months, and then later they even had to take part of language tests in their home countries already before they could activate the job. So, what you can say about their immigration in the the 90s, there were mainly ethnically German immigrants, that means immigrants to Germany. Most of the family members were ethnically German, and then later, uh, by the end of the 90s, they were mainly economically motivated migration, and uh, part of the German family members were families were mixed, Russian and German. You can also see it here the composition of the migrants. So, in the beginning, the majority of the migrants were ethnic Germans, and later they were mixed families. But all of these people, if one family member was an ethnic German, bring, bring it, uh, is um, offspring and spouses, all of these family members immediately got the um, German citizenship. That's to the history of the Germans, of okay, the Germans from Russia. If you want to talk about migration in general again, we have this so called epidemiological transition that is also known to some of you. So, um, so that's the, about the population development. In Places. We have the first phase of low income countries where we have repeated demands, high rates of infectious disease, and low child expectancy. And then we have the second phase, there's always some developing happening, so we have increasing mortality, picking of the exponential population growth, and less epidemics. And the third phase, where most of the high income countries are nowadays, high life expectancy, increasing birth rate, and coming out of chronic disease. Oftentimes, the migrants may shift. Very quickly from one of these phases to the third phase, or from the first phase to the second phase. So they are shifting from completely different settlements to a new one, new environment. And they have to manage this transition for at least in very short time. Um, hence, you can, we can say that migration is a very big challenge in life. You have to shift between different environments, like natural environments, but also um, different health systems and health threats. So there are health threats. They have different country of origin to the target country. They have different health systems. They have different cultural ideas of health. It's also very important to talk about uh, psychosomatic diseases, for instance, and psychosomatic issues. Um, and it is called a health transition. And in addition to that, we have migration related stress that can affect the cardiovascular disease, can, can cause cardiovascular diseases. And in addition to that, we have psychological and mental stress. Oftentimes, migration comes along with economic and social decline. So, you have to accept work, um, maybe you, you have a, an academic degree in your country of origin, but this is not recognized in the host country, in the target country, and then you will um, experience a social decline. And also, oftentimes, migrants they experience that they can't use their coping mechanisms, which they are used to in their original country, so they question. Uh, Improving coping mechanisms doesn't work in the new environment, and they have to learn new coping mechanisms to cope with to, to the stress in this new um, environment. The migration itself can be differentiated in different 
there is a so the bottom line is the data right in most countries, that's the initial data phase that takes about one year, where they are culturally inside the social uncertainty. Um, then they start to get in contact with the local population, and that oftentimes is also um, comes along with some so-called overcompensation. So we try to adapt all the cultural habits of this um, new population of this new environment in society. And that oftentimes is then followed by the security phase where they experience some crisis. So they do the critically um, question this new culture in this new country. And that is oftentimes when they have some psychological crisis where they um, there's a high risk of mental disorders, of discretion, of course. But also, people want, want to go back to their home country, but really, they stop, they stop um, opting for the departure. And then there's the integration phase, that uh, can be a partial cultural adaptation. They often attempt to keep cultural traditions and develop new habits in parallel. So, oftentimes, this is the phase when integration really starts. And this integration phase that can really last several generations. So we often might see that if you especially look at the second generation migrants, that they really still struggle with the integration in this new culture. Also, the parents are already sort of integrated. Here you can say, see different acculturation styles. Um, we talk about integration, assimilation, segregation, right? marginalization. Um, and they have like integration would be the best. It means you um, really integrate in the host country, but you still keep your traditions and you still also improve the relation to your home country. That means helping people to your home country, your home country, stay in contact, stay in uh, exchange with your home country. Um, difference to that is the assimilation that you completely take over the culture of the host country and the connection to the home country is cut. Um, Segregation means the integration doesn't work, there is no link to the new culture, and they stick to the culture of the whole country if you look at segregation. Um, the worst is migrantization, where both links are cut and these people are really left alone and um, yeah, don't need to any of these cultures anymore. Now, why do we do research with the general repatriates? So anybody, can anybody imagine what this map is showing? This map of Europe and Croatia. Any idea? Okay, well, also, these are the cardiovascular um, disease, this cardiovascular disease mortality. That is cardiovascular disease mortality in 2005. Um, page adjusted. And you can see that in the Russian Federation, the cardiovascular disease mortality was three to four times higher. Three to four from higher than the German, that we had about 300,000, and Russia was about 1,150 to 1,000. And you can see a clear um, east west gradient here. So that means there is not, it's not only an artificial statistical or a random variation, there's a clear gradient linked to some. Environmental conditions to lifestyle and success. And why do we do why there are markers in this research? So that was known. Now I mentioned there come around two million German graduates from this area of Germany. What are the consequences? The consequences are that this leads right to the health system, that we need prevention for these people if they really there is cardiovascular diseases, they need to be treated. So that's an economical burden for the health system. Um, here you can see the trends in cardiovascular diseases between like differences between Russia and Germany. Um, you can see like this, this process here, these are males and these are females. And the brown lines are Russia and the blue are Germany. So in Germany there is a continuous decline in cardiovascular disease mortality for both sexes. There's still a difference, but it's declining. And in Russia, you can see a huge fluctuation, a huge different difference between both sexes and a huge fluctuation. And you can see even some political events, like here, the collapse of the former Soviet Union, there was a massive increase in cardiovascular disease mortality. So in Russia, cardiovascular disease mortality is strongly linked to political events. Um, 
And that is mainly due to some specific habits of mainly um, young Russians, the so called which is quite common. So the overall other one is that it's not that much different from German or from West European populations, but it's this injury where you drink a lot of alcohol in the short time. And also the specific beverages of alcohol like um, vodka, which also contributes to this um, model. We know it from some studies, sometimes it's said that um, alcohol is key preventing some cardiovascular disease, like French people. They are known to have the least, uh, the lowest blood vessel disease in other people, and they have a fiber of wine. So there are some um, suggestions that wine contains some protective factors. Um, but for this big shrinking, this has an immediate effect on the heart. So there's no protection at all. The big shrinking really affects the heart muscle and then leads to cardiomyopathy. You can see even the subgroups of cardiovascular diseases, so also for cerebral vascular diseases. Scanning heart disease, you can see the same pattern. And you can also see here the um, demographic figures for Russia the deaths, the overall deaths, uh, sorry, overall births. Births probably dramatically around 1990, overall deaths increasing. You can see here the same pattern um, as for cardiovascular disease because cardiovascular disease are the strongest. So, Heidelberg initiated this policy for mortality studies called Farmore in Germany to investigate the health status of German repatriates. There was a first cohort with around 34,000 resettlers in North Carolina. Then we had another cohort in Saarland, and that actually was my cohort in Augsburg. Small cohort, but the idea behind the small cohort was that we wanted to set up a prospective cohort. So, all these other cohorts, they were register based studies and just investigated the uh, uh, health status of the house leader by looking at the death certificates and comparing the death frequency to Germans. And in our exposure, they actually wanted to do the same, but initially set up the prospective cohort. The findings of these studies and the combined of these results um, were very interesting and surprising. So we didn't find an increase in overall mortality, we didn't find an increase in cardiovascular disease mortality. We found the opposite, which is a significantly decreased cardiovascular disease mortality for both sexes. That was really surprising. That's also true for subgroups of cardiovascular disease. There was an increase, a significant increase of infectious disease mortality among women, what also makes sense. And there were a decrease um, deaths due to neoplasms in women. And then another the alarming finding was an external cause, increase of external cause of death in men significantly increased. But that was really the most surprising because it gave our hypothesis. Um, the first idea was now, okay, maybe that's the healthy life in the back, but that's not the point. Or that will be more young children who came back to Germany, um, that they have, that they have like, they were all healthy, of course. But there are many arguments against this. Um, like um, healthy life in effect. Specifically in Augsburg, we observed that um, a lot of people that really live at old age and in Germany are below 90 years. We observed in Augsburg that 20 persons of this cohort of 6,300 died due to severe disease for the first year after arriving in Germany. So they really they were really severely sick. And we know that from the families arrived in Germany, that there was support from the government to really let all these families um, come to Germany. So they had this massive immigration stimulus by the German government, and there were no depart departure obstructions in the also the team, so they really had people go. So the healthy migrant effect was not the cause for this observation. Then um, there was a funny story, funny press release in a German newspaper. I was talking for the Gesundheits immigration um, is supporting all this is, Health and it just read this article of Heidi Becher and then said, Yeah, you can break the hell here. But that's actually what, it's, what the findings don't say if you look in more detail. So, what we then did in Augsburg, we repeated the study and we linked like the additional register data, not only mortality data, but in that case, myocardial infarction incidents. And we found 
of fossil fuels to the mortality, we found an increase in risk specifically for men. 1.3, or sorry, was 1.3. Um, that means a 30 percent increase of any mitral infarction new or um, surviving without support general practice. So the mortality was lower, but incidence was higher. How, how that? If you look in more detail, we can see that the mitral infarction incidence was specifically high of men who immigrated between 1995 and 1999. And if you remember how um, the composition of the court changed. That means later on we had many Russians, like ethnically Russians, in these families. And these people they were really used to the Russian culture. So they could have bought some of these risk factors like huge drinking and so forth. Also, smoking was higher in this group of ethnic Russians. And also here you can see the risk was particularly high among men um, aged less than 15. So it also relates to this. Um, observation in Russia is particular men between 40 and 50 are high risk of life due to cardiovascular disease. And then, additionally, we looked in the um, migration as a life event, and what we found there with regard to suicides, that specifically people immigrating in the age between 10 and 19 in their properties, they were at highest risk for suicides. Um, that is just suicide extended. That means we did some additional investigation where we also included some suspicious cases that is also clear that they um, were committing suicide or not. But we could see a very high risk in all of these groups. Then we did a survey in Augsburg. We really wanted to get, you know, to get know more details about how safe are the lifestyles, in particular, also with regard to cardiovascular diseases and change. I incidents. And we did a lot, we put a lot of efforts to really start the study to get the data. We had a lot of support by press releases. You can see it was published in many outscrollable newspapers and regional papers, also in some Russian um, German Association of Repet Rates, some Russian newspapers. There were discussions on media, social media, it's a Russian. Facebook, so to say, they discussed this study and really were interested. Um, and the concept of the survey was the, at the end, um, yeah, at the end, all these efforts didn't really work out. We had a very low response rate of 16%. We wanted to investigate the migration history, social conditions, health, lifestyle, and risk factors, and efficient to have self rated health, because self rated health is a very important part of the region health. Um, and also we wanted to investigate the contribution factors for some of these But as I said, the response rate was very low. We experienced that the housing of our school in Germany is that they were really in very close and encapsulated communities. It was very hard to really get in contact with them. We had very good contact and very good collaboration with the Association of Chamber Factories, Augsburg. These made up to 20% of the population. They are really good. They, they were not able to really motivate and mobilize these people. And what we also experienced is a deep distrust and distrust in governmental and public institutions by this German graduates. So they, they wanted to contribute, but as soon as they had to sign something officially, they um, refused their data. So the result of the survey that only 47% of the German graduates received their health as less than good, and that's compared to the general public, the general public we have 20%. So there's a huge difference. 52% <coughs> of the outsider have a high blood pressure, so it's very high. 34% were obese, 40% um, suffered from frequent pain, 13 had diabetes mellitus, and then you could also find that suffering from pain, even from mobility, diabetes mellitus, and high blood pressure were. Um, the most contributing factors to the low of the poor celebrated health. What is the interesting thing about these findings? If you think about the response rate of 16%, what does it mean? What does the response rate of 16% mean about the group? Um, that means it's a very, that usually it's a very selective group, right? It's most probably people who are healthy, who are interested in health, they take part in the survey. Um, we also knew their, their profession, so we saw that many of them were 
physicians or nurses or to do some uh, health profession. But even this group had these very poor health conditions. So that means in general group, I'll see for the general athletes conditions most only worse than the world. In our in more detail, you can see here the prevalence of food self health and you can see it was only the youngest of the youngest age group here from zero to what we call they had similar results to Germans and all the others had less good self great health and grammatically less good self great health. Blood pressure was almost higher in all the groups compared to men and women and also um, this year's diabetes, so we all everybody had higher diabetes rates compared to Germans. Um, that is the medication in the last seven days. Here the picture is the opposite, so here you can see that the Aussie they didn't take as much medication as the Germans. That is a hint that they might have less access to the health care system, or might be using the health care system probably. Um, we don't know yet what is behind there, but it was also clear observation. You can see more age groups, medication is much less compared to Germans. Here you can see the body mass index, and you can see that all the age groups exceed the normal, um, yeah, except this one, this one here, the medium, the mean is still within the normal range, but all the others exceed the normal ranges of BMI for this age group. Lifestyle, physical activity, and smoking, similar picture. So um, men were less physically active, women were less physically active, women were less smoking, but the men. They were similarly smoking than the Germans in this group. But the physical activity pattern is quite quite weird. So they seem that they don't move at all. The results, in summary, we have seen that there was initially lower CV mortality, but was the disease mortality among the researchers. Then we have also seen in study that these rates in depth with German rates in the meantime, and which were here, but it was one of the observations. We had an increased risk for myocardial carbon function in male athletes. Um, we had a high rate of death due to external causes and suicides. Um, so this is a serious prevalence problem in this group, especially among young, young male athletes. The repair rates report poor self rate health, they have a higher mobility, but less medication, and they have low physical activity. With regard to cardiovascular diseases, we can see, say, um, that normally, if you um, investigate such microgroups in the mortality pattern, mirror the conditions in the countries of origin. That was also what we expected, that they have a higher cardiovascular disease mortality. And usually, the cardiovascular disease mortality depends on the social economic status. It's known that the Germans in Russia, at least in the last 50 60 years, oftentimes had a lower social economic status than the general Russian population because they were seen, they were not seen anymore as. Um, Guests, but it's in the enemies. Um, so, but still, we have this lower cardiovascular disease mortality. And the question now is how can we explain that? And the only explanation is that they really had a completely different lifestyle from Russians in Russia. And that also makes sense because if you look in these low density populated areas in eastern Russia, they live in their own communities, interested communities, and in the Russian population. They were usually very religious, they had their sports associations, they didn't drink much. Um, however, there's hardly any data available on that. We had one of those who tried to get some data on that. She did interviews on telephone with relatives of, of um, Germans who were kids, and she could find out some of this. So there are some hints that this is actually true. Then there was one theory that I could have been genetic selection, that means Location in eastern parts of Russia, most probably only the weak people or first weak people died. And if these are areas of um, genes of this, that there was more cardiovascular diseases, maybe there was a genetic selection and these genes didn't survive this population. But there are some arguments against this genetic selection, so we know that cardiovascular diseases they depend on many, many, many genes, right? In each of the genes, they usually contribute only a little to the cardiovascular disease risk. And there's also a Going on, and it makes it very unprobable that they have a possibility to make a selection. There are also other arguments which are against this genetic selection, so that is most of not the case. So, so, most probably, it's a different lifestyle. 
Now the question is why is the myocardial function incidence among the male the male receptors in general increasing? It also can be explained by this transition to this new settlement to this new environment. In Russia, for instance, there was a centralized system, everything was not in a central symphony, so also um, the government was looking at the better jobs available and so forth. There was no competition on the job market. Now they come to Germany, they have a high competitive job market, the population density is much higher, they have to earn the livings, they have to learn the language, or relearn the language, and so forth, and that is a lot of stress. And especially for this group of people, they are the main, the main skills of the breadwinner of the family, um, they really were struggling because they oftentimes end up long term unemployment, um, and they really had to suffer from that. And that is, could explain this increase. Why does mortality not increase in parallel? Well, that has to do with the healthcare system. We know that in Germany, myocardial infarction can be treated if it's recognized early enough. It also has to do with the lifetime effect. Right? So, that other cardiovascular diseases they take longer to really onset. So, that might be visible maybe in 10 to 15 years or so forth because it also cardiovascular disease mortality is now exceeding the German rates. We know already that the rates adapted to the German rates, so now we have similar rates in other countries, similar cardiovascular, similar cardiovascular disease mortality rates in the Germans and in the German population, and maybe they are exceeding the future. And also, there is also known from research that risk factors are present the better the chance of survival. Why is that? Because the risk factor is known to the physician, either prevents or either alive. Some medication, some preventive medication that is, um, can be then seen in these products that people with higher risk factors have a lower um, cardiovascular disease in terms of because they have some preventive treatment. Uh, suicides. So there are some strange observations. You know that the German receptors speak German to some extent, right? But still, they have much higher unemployment rates than any other. Or in so many other migrants. You can see the figures in Bavaria 2004. Children with rates, they had an unemployment rate of 29%, foreigners 15%, and the natives 17%. So that's a huge, huge number. Um, they came from a hostile environment in Russia, where they were called Nazis, and they came to Germany, where they were called Russians. Right? So they didn't come home, they didn't they really expect to come home to Germany. But in Germany, the culture developed completely different, and they are encapsulated in our communities in Russia. They were keeping their traditions, but they didn't find them in Germany. They had a strong family connection back in Russia, in their communities, but this family connection was questioned in Germany because there was a lot of um, friction, a lot of tension in the communities, and this high population, population density, and um, unemployment, of course, questioned this family. I said it already, so Germany was expected as a homeland, but it was not like that. Um, and also, that explains the high suicide rates among the people immigrating in poverty. These, the children, they have actually not been included in the decision to emigrate to Germany. And most of the children in the 80s and 90s, these were the first generation of people who started living in this Russian population in the Russian culture. They went to Russian schools because they didn't speak Russian or German anymore in this mother tongue. So they were maybe much better integrated in the current generation, but they were not in the position to integrate, and they were forced to integrate, and they didn't want to integrate. They had religious freedom, freedom in Germany, but there was a high competition, or still a high competition in the labor market, and also the different concepts of mental health, especially mental health. Mental health issues um, are taboo or very taboo in Russia. Oftentimes, um, psychiatry was used for political prostitution instead of treatment of ill and mental disorders. So, these people they really don't talk about their mental issues, they don't choose to talk about um, any um, mental disorders. And integration in German society is known that 45% of the ethnic Germans they speak Russian only. Also, there are part of the family members are ethnically in German. 46 speak a mixture between Russian and German. The post language are 
dieses Open schon gemacht haben, belegt uns der Open Speed schon die Macht. Jetzt gibt es Kultur, Chance und Lego-Mike und Computation. Um, then this composition of the family is all done during the 90s or mentioned that and we had this categorization. It was also supported by politics. So I know from my village, I come from in the next hour, they put up a settlement for ethnic Germans. The only ethnic Germans are living now, right? And the idea was if they come to Germany and they move to, to a place where they some ethnic Germans are settling, they might help them like feel like home. But it actually led to a ghettoization. So they speak Russian there, the, the shops, they have Russian language in the windows. Then um, there are budget constraints due to this um, uh, political issues. They reduced the language courses and the immigration support. And we had a high unemployment rate, especially among academics and journalists. So, what's, what can we learn from that with regard to migration in general? You know, migration is a global model and can have a local impact. The migrants come to host country, countries. In general, with regard to medicine, we know that language problems, they don't, they, they um, hinder diagnosis of diseases, they lower treatment and heat adherence. Um, we have these different concepts of health and diseases. Um, mental disorders are often seen as a taboo, or often a taboo problem in the kind of support chain. Um, the complaints they have are often psychosomatic. Have pain issues and then they don't get any psychological support or understanding. They get medication here, you know, uh, satisfied with that. They move to the next position. It's like a position called a shift position hopping from one position to the other. And they really don't get a good thing like the promising to my life. In the German practice, we saw that they had no medication compared to the Germans, so that could be a specificity, specificity of this specific group. Um, but for many other migrant groups, it's known that there are issues of medicalization that moves forward, medicalization instead of really psychological treatment. Also, over diagnosis, since they went from doctor to doctor, they get many diagnoses, but not really the help they need. Um, what to do? What can public health do? We know this positive example of the Landsmannschaft. So, that's an association which is recognized um, by German politics and by the local governments, and they're really doing a lot of good things. So they're doing integration courses in the schools, they help the children learn um, languages, they help the families, they help the parents, they do a lot. This is what I observe in our school. Um, so that is one thing what could be supported by politics, um, by the government, that there are structures in the ethnic Germans from Russia, or some other migrant groups which could be used as a resource for integration. For the prevention, we usually have individual approaches in Germany that means prevention is individualized to persons. I'm sure for the ethnic Germans from Russia, we need a second approach. That means you also, if it comes to instance, uh, prevention of mental disorders or suicides, it's the history of the family which is important. Did they force their children to come? Were the children integrated in the decision? Um, were they very religious when they were back? How was the history of this family with the migrant? So we need more um, group of family oriented approach instead of an individual approach. Then we have group phenomena. In this, if you have these um, close communities, there are group phenomena. So unemployment is very high there. Um, also, uh, Participation in society is key, that means we have to get them into the society. So you can see that in the refugees now as well, who are sitting in the camps for a long time, they're not allowed to work, they're not allowed to take part in society. They really have to sit there and wait, and that really needs a lot of frustration. And long term, there's long term stress, long term that needs to handle these orders. As I said, for the suicide prevention, Identity is very important. It's the identity of the family and the migration is very important. Are they seeing themselves more as Russians or are they seeing themselves closer to the German culture? That is very important. And maybe we need a paradigm shift, maybe we need to move from research on negative impact of migration to a more resource, resource oriented approach. They bring some resources with them. So they had a high family condition in Russia, for instance. Why can't we use that for migration or prevention of disease? 
that's it. We are some of the papers we publish. So maybe have a better for the finger, finger, you know, maybe also some of the other names like Oliver Rasu, um, some of the cultures here. Are there any questions? Yeah, I have a question of what we mentioned on paradox and where you think has the hypothesis that um, this uh, identification of risk factors lead to better outcomes that um, there I, I think I um, to me that was not so convincing because we have many many areas where the lead risk factors that the link that you are recognized as risk that's very often not lead to an improvement. And in many areas, areas of health, 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 That they could show that. So that's really, you can do observe the people, how these people can better survive. Um, the people who is a lot more respect. It's a very sensitive. I can have a on that. Sure. He said, I don't know this term article, but he said comparing, which had essentially the same risk profile, one part of that population is risk profile is known. So it's active one, and then the other, the other part, they have the same risk profile, but they have not gone for screening programs, they have not gone for blood pressure checks. So, um, or is it those with these risk factors compared to people who don't have that risk factor? That is what I'm These are yeah. people with, with um, a high risk profile, that many, that many of these factors already in young ages. Compared to the general public, so these are people who eat, smoke, drink, and so forth. Right? Many, many respectors in place early in life. And they usually get um, early support by the physicians. Um, they, they usually um, get a lot of things on the random medication. And that leads to a survival advantage because the others who have less respectors, which are not infected and not treated, they get severe sickness in a short time later, but die early. That was the I don't follow up on that because to me it's kind of intuitive. I would say because there are there are also many in, instances where a risk label leads to increased interventions and to more, more follow-up investigations, which often do not improve the survival in many areas. So maybe it depends on that. Yeah, I think it's interesting. These were all predominantly males. Yes. Um, the women, the women they, they have their traditional roles in these families. That means they often have their academic degrees, but then they school at home with the children, they raise the children, and they didn't have this burden to the job bar, like the company of the job bar, for instance, to raise the children. So even like in Russia, they didn't they both sexes in bring them out. But in males specifically, they were um, under pressure, the breadwinners for the living. And they were unemployed, they are unemployed children for long term, so they turned to this bad habits of drinking. Um, and then they are not, they are also, um, they, they lose their status within the families. The women, they, they continue staying at home, taking care of the children. They basically, like they have their traditional roles. Uh, prevents diseases because uh, the women have no choice. As we say, they lost their work there. Now they have their children, wonderful, uh, but they are they are uh, bound to be families. But it was their decision. Like, uh, yeah, okay, they made 
force that decision, I agree. But once they are here, maybe they have regret the decision. Because they, I think this is stress which which the males normally don't perceive. Um, they, have, they, have, they have very clear position on family bonds, very position on family bonds. And they, yeah. they don't question that it's in the short time, just by being exposed to the technology. So you can see that if you there are sometimes there are some events from this um, association of German ethnic jobs in Russia. You can go there, they have very traditional events and traditional music, and which is all which is not for what we can do. They have them in their Russian communities, and they, have, they are still very religious, they are very traditional, and that's at least for the women, it makes that much difference compared to their kind of origin. And what, what about obesity and obesity? As I showed you, obesity is an issue in all of the sexes, but um, also a big issue with sex in the women, and also physical inactivity, so they definitely will also get diseases. Right? Most of the more than the general, general, general public population. But it's yeah. invisible yet yeah, because um, we didn't look into detail, in detail um, into these specific causes of mortality. We had very investigated cardiovascular disease mortality in the um, mortality due to mental disorders more of the time. And these are um, the consequences of obesity that must be visible in diabetes, there are other issues. Which still might be not useful because they might have had a different lifestyle in Russia. Right? But they were still more active, they did move more, they had more conversations, they, eat, uh, they had a different um, diet, of course. So, this disease is still on the second thing. that they will not be living out of daily life. I have a question. It was not clear to me why the incidence of infectious diseases was a higher just in the um, Yeah, it's also not clear to us why it was just higher, why just the women. I mean, it makes sense that it's higher than it might be, right? Because you come from an environment where you have um, different uh, infectious diseases head up. We have no, no explanation why it's only higher. Have any um, idea about the social integration of, the, uh, of these people? They come here, they come to the society, and we know that they are marginalized uh, in respect, but do, do you know whether they get more integrated? I know that there are two groups. Uh, there's one group of journalists called the veterans, and they really want to integrate, they want to speak German, they refuse to speak Russian, right? These people are mainly organized in these um, associations. They are very well integrated. They have also high prestige jobs. They mean you know, the German population. They have, they have contacts to politics and so forth. And then there's a big other group who doesn't want to integrate, who keeps speaking Russian, does not speak German. And these are the people who can't really reach or are hard to reach. And these people oftentimes live in these Russian districts of the city. So, in Augsburg, there's one district. All the university, there are around 30% of the populations are in this Russian speaking German families in Russia, together with other ethnic Germans from Poland and so forth. And that's like a different, different world. And they are really, in that, in that case, I think the, the government they made a mistake when they allowed this um, categorization and this settlement in Hydra. Yes. And for them, yeah. Okay. I have many questions. Yes. <laughs> um, when uh, time ago, Albania uh, changed, we, uh, I think the Albanians were very clever because they exiled all the criminals. I think this was a very clever move of the Albanian government, or whatever it was. And so they got rid of, these are harsh words, yeah, but they got rid of people that 
work and I remember from that time here there was a huge influx of Albanians and Jews with all like the foreigners, I think there was a huge problem. I don't know how it's solved, but I perceive also that the Russians have their underground connections as other people have. So could it be that there was also a push of getting rid of uh, uh, people from the Russian society uh, that they were and privilege license to do so. This at least, at least the Russian government did try to stop that information. They didn't support it. So there was an agreement between the Russian government and German government that this immigration of the German people is supported by the Russian government. So they had no problem. No. No problem. Oh, no. As I said, German so government is in the world, the German government is in the state of the airfare that we need. Yeah. Now then this yeah. argument is wrong. Jamila, bei den Gangs of the 90s, there was a different composition of this immigrants. So, in that time, the German government, they, they tried to reduce the influx of the migrants from the future because they knew that the composition is changing. So, we had many Russians living, Russians coming with the German families. It's part of the um, And then the German government decided that they had to do language tests in the whole country. But only one member of the family had to do language tests. So the foods in front of the family was German, and the farm parts and the chefs, all the family could come. And that leads to this, that to this change in composition. That only led to an economically driven emigration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, we have a huge Russian mafia in our country, and they are very strong, and they are connected to this migration. So I wonder why um, these kind of uh, criminal organizations um, are not limited to uh, such a house. They are, how should we have Germans? Okay. But I just wonder when uh, this. Migration has been done to promote these activities. This is what I, I suspect, but I would like to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if you don't speak the language, uh, I can help you. And of course, then you have to make a long expectation. Russia, uh, you realize that you're not coming to paradise, so this also creates a lot of transactions. Thank you very much. Like questions, thank you very much for the Many of us are medical students. Thank you very much. Have a great evening.